In the prior sections, you took a deeper dive into regression, which is essentially the art of predicting an output number from some inputs. You started with a simple linear regression prediction using a single neuron without an activation function, and then progressed to predicting nonlinear data using multiple layers of neurons with activation functions. In this section, you'll learn about classification, which is all about predicting what class some input features represent instead. Let's start by visually reminding yourself of what classification is doing. Essentially, you have some data points with some features like the ones shown. If you plotted them on a scatter plot, it might look something like this. However, in this case, each point represents a certain class of data. Maybe this scatter plot is showing results for two different types of flowers plotted against two common input features. Maybe the number of petals and stem length, for example. Now, in the previous section, you learned that by combining layers of neurons, you can essentially combine multiple lines of best fit to create a system that can predict nonlinear data. In the case of classification, you can do something similar, but instead of using that line to predict a single number, you use it to separate one class from another as shown. Here, you can see how three lines were used to separate the orange from the green dots, which cannot be separated with a single straight line. And what about this slightly more extreme example with a lot more data? It's the same principle really, and with enough neurons and layers, you can potentially train a system to learn some very complex and intricate classifications. In the example shown here, for a new given recording, if it's contained within these lines, it's a class two, and if it's contained outside, then it's gonna be class one. Now, what if you had an example point for every X and Y value on the graph within some given range? What would that look like? Well, an image actually fits that description pretty well. Here you've got a magnified grayscale image with the number one drawn on it in white. Each pixel is represented by a colored square in X and Y on the graph, as you can see. And just like before, you can define what parts of the image the number one is typically contained in. So for all new images, you can check all the non-black pixels. And if you find they're mostly contained within the same bounds of these three lines, then you have seen a number one. And contrast this to say the number five, and you can see how many of the white pixels are outside the bounds of the found lines for the number one with only 30% inside. From this, you can see from a high level at least, how you might be able to train a system to tell them apart with neurons looking for different features in different parts of the image. So maybe you want to recognize handwritten numerical digits like this. You would have 10 possible numbers you would need to recognize zero to nine. Let's see how you could create a simple model to do that. First though, how might you break down an image to be fed into your model? Well, it's actually pretty easy to break down into the rows of individual pixels that make up the image as shown. After all, a grayscale image is just a matrix of numbers ranging from zero to 255, representing different shades of gray from pure white being 255 and pure black being zero. Here you have an example image that's just 28 by 28 pixels in size so it would have 28 rows. You now take all of the rows of data and turn them into a really huge one dimensional array of 784 values, which you can then use as the inputs to your machine learning model. Okay, so let's put it all together. A 28 by 28 pixel image would represent 784 input values to your model as shown after all your rows are broken down into one big long line of numbers. In this example, you have a grayscale image. So these input values represent 255 different shades of gray, depending on the number that they are. Next, you could add a fully connected dense layer of say seven neurons, and every neuron in this input layer samples all of the 784 input pixels. Here, you can see all of the first neurons connections shown by the orange lines, for example. That means there are 5,488 connections made between those seven neurons and every pixel input, even though this image is tiny. You can see how larger images would get very computationally intensive very fast, which is why image inputs in machine learning are typically pretty small. Next, you can add a hidden layer of five neurons that sample the outputs of the neurons in the input layer, shown here, which creates a further 35 connections as these are also fully connected. Finally, you can add 10 more neurons in the output layer that sample the outputs of the hidden layer, creating 50 further connections. Note that your neural network now has a total of 5,573 connections 
that's a lot of weights to train. Also, having 10 outputs is different to what you had done before. In this case, each neuron in this output layer represents a vote for each of the one of the possible 10 digits from 0 to 9, which is why there are 10 neurons in this last layer. In this situation, once all the weight calculations have flowed through the network, the output neuron with the highest value is the one it predicts is the correct class for the input image. You can also see how your networks of neurons are getting larger and with time may even have more layers, which is where the term deep neural network actually comes from as they have a high layer depth. Assuming numbers are drawn roughly centered in the input image, you can imagine at this stage that by adjusting all the weights and biases in your model thousands of times, it will slowly be able to figure out that for a given digit, certain pixel inputs are more important than others and give those pixels higher weights. Remember, all of the weights are initially random, so it'd be pretty bad at the start, but if it gets something wrong, it can calculate how wrong it was and update the weights to move in the right direction so they tend to produce a higher value at the correct output that represents that digit. But how does it know which output represents which digit? If you just take your current code to have 10 outputs, it will not work as expected. Instead, you must turn the network into one that classifies instead of performing regression. Let's see how to do that. First, you must learn about a new technique known as one-hot encodings when dealing with categorical data such that information can be represented numerically in a fair manner. The name one hot sounds pretty random, but the principle is pretty simple. Currently, you're trying to predict 10 possible digits for numbers from 0 to 9. However, if you're using the literal numbers as the target output, here the model may think that a 9 is worth more than a 0, which is not the case. Or what if it predicts a value of 3.5? What does that even mean when you're trying to deal with images that represent whole numbers? Also, consider a different use case where you're not trying to predict images of numbers, but instead maybe the images are of cats and dogs. How do you represent those numerically in a fair way? Remember, after all, you just have a bunch of weights and biases you're trying to tweak to get some numerical answer, not text answer. Well, with a one-hot encoding, you simply have a one-dimensional array of numbers where all the numbers are zero, apart from the position that represents the class of interest, which will be a one. You can see here that the number four is represented by the one-hot encoding shown where the fifth element in the array is sent to one, as the first element would represent the digit zero. It's zero indexed after all. In a similar fashion, you can convert all of your output answers into one-hot encodings. So instead of predicting one output, you'll be predicting 10 outputs where just one of those outputs is set to one. The machine learning model can then learn to produce the highest value in that position for that example image data, and then that becomes a prediction of what it thought it saw in the input image. So putting all together then, you can see now how the outputs used to train the system are represented by this one hot encoding. Ideally, in the situation shown, with a number nine as an input, you want to produce an output where the last element in the output tensor is close to one and all the others are close to zero. You then know that the network thinks it saw a nine. So the next piece of the puzzle is a new activation function known as softmax. Currently, all the models you've had had no activation function on the output layer as you were just performing regressions. In order to perform classification instead of regression, you will need to use a special activation function known as softmax. Again, it's another fancy name, but all it means is that it will just produce output numbers, no matter how many outputs there might be, that sum to one. The only other thing to note is that softmax will only work well if the outputs that you're trying to predict are mutually exclusive. That is, that they're never overlapping with each other. For example, any given number can't be both a one and a two. It's either, but not both. If you know that the hand-drawn number is a two, you know for sure that the number can't be anything else. Now, that sounds pretty good for your classification problem, as you want to know how sure it was when it saw something, with very tiny values for the wrong classes and a value close to one for the class that is most likely. Seems like a perfect match for your one-hot encoding. Now, the final piece of the puzzle is a new loss function that you can specify. It turns out that different loss functions work best for different types of jobs. In the case of regression, you use the mean squared error that you previously learned about. However, for multi-class classification, in the case of this digit recognition task, you will need to change your loss function to use something called categorical cross-entropy, 
This is simply a loss function that's well suited for classification tasks with three or more outcomes like the one you have here. Even better, TensorFlow.js has this implemented for all of you to use, so you can just change the name of the loss function as shown and you'll be good to go. Also take note, there's also one called binary cross entropy if you just have two classes to predict in case you ever need to do that. For example, you might need to check if an image contains a hot dog or not. In this case, there'd be only two possible outcomes if you're only interested in hot dogs. Okay, so you've got the theory covered. Now it's time to find some training data. Remember, you wanted to recognize all the numerical digits from zero to nine. There's actually a famous training data set of this called MNIST that contains hundreds of handwritten digits like the ones shown on the slide. If you can get that data, you can potentially train a deep neural network to learn from that data. Well, in the name of time, I've already got a copy of that data for you, normalized it, and transformed it into a JavaScript-friendly array form. So in the next section, you'll take that data and write some code to create your first image classifier. See you there.